Gabriel Church. Good to see you guys. Kind of. Uh, glad you can see me. Glad you joined us online here this morning. We're um, excited to jump into the Word. We're on a series here called Exodus because we're in the book of Exodus. Uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 30, so if you have your Bible, uh, that would be a great place for you to turn. And while you find your place there, I want to tell you a story. Um, the story of my Tuesday morning. Um, it started out like most Tuesdays. I woke up at 5.30 and I uh, wanted to spend some time reading in the Word, spending time with the Lord. I mean, that's not a flex, by the way. Uh, you know, like I read for, you know, all kinds and wake up early and all that. It's just because I have kids, right? They wake up anytime between 6.30 and 7.30. So if I want any time to myself, I have to wake up early. And so anyways, I did that. Um, I started making their lunches for school and and um, Ari, by the way, was out of town. You know, she was on an overnight out of town trip. So I was on my own, completely and utterly on my own. I got there, um, lunches made, the kids mercifully slept until about 7.45, which is really good for me. But, um, you know, that meant that we were running late. And so uh, I had to rush to get them ready. Uh, I got Ellie, you know, all dressed up, got her some pigtails. They were very crooked and I didn't like that, but you know, we, did it, they got ready, we hustled them into the van, I go to start it, and that was dead. Kind of a bummer, right? And so, first thought is, I'll call Ari, and then I remember, hey, she's out of town, so there's no help coming there. And uh, I, I didn't know what I was going to do, I was contemplating just kind of canceling the day. Um, when my neighbor came outside, and he had some jumper cables ready to rock, and he helped jump the van, uh, had a great conversation, got the kids all the way uh, to school. Um, I was able to, you know, dodge all of the people watching the air balloons going 50 miles per hour in the fast lane on I-25, and I got Ellie all the way to school without a hitch, um, get back in the car to take Jack to his daycare and uh, get him there without an issue. And then after I drop him off, I come back out in to get in my van, I go to start the van, and the battery is dead again. So great, it's looking like we didn't just leave a light on and the battery died, and it looks like there's a problem with the battery. It's not holding a charge. So I'm sitting there again trying to figure out what I'm going to do when the daycare's groundskeeper came over with some jumper cables and again just hooked me up and got me on my way. Now I'm kind of concerned about the battery, um, but I, you know, I figure I'm going to test my luck here. I had one more stop to make before I could go home. I had to go pick up a part because our dishwasher hasn't been working. And so I go to the part store, and hey, praise God, they've got the part in stock. I get it. I'm excited about it. And I go back out to the van, and I go to start it, and guess what's not working? It's the battery again, right? So I shouldn't be surprised. Well, again, I, you know, God's providence, there were some guys across the street, happened to see my predicament, came and gave my van a jump start. And so at this point, okay, I got to tell you, I was proud of myself. Because I have not lost my mind yet, right? After the third dead battery attempt, I, I, I normally would have lost my mind a little bit. And even before that, I didn't get frustrated and take it out on my kids. I didn't have a meltdown. I kept my cool. I kept going. And so I'm feeling pretty good about myself at this point. And so I start driving home. I kind of make some calls. I have plans to replace the battery later in the day. I've got a backup plan just in case it dies in the driveway and I can't even get to that. I'm feeling good. I go inside. I've got the part for the dishwasher. I'm like, man, I've got this, right? So I go and I follow the instructions. I install the part. I push start on the dishwasher. It works. And this is a big deal, right? Like a very big deal for me because in addition to being vertically challenged, I'm also uh, directionally challenged and I'm very bad at fixing things. So the fact that this happened is a big deal. Like this is how bad I am at fixing stuff. I, I had to call my dad one time when the toilet flappy thingy wasn't working, and, and I just I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know what it's called, and I had to call him to get help with that, right? When my water heater uh, wasn't working, you know, I didn't just like roll up my sleeves and get to work. No, I called a friend to come and help me, and when I say help me, I mean I watched them do it while they, you know, they did it for me because I didn't know what I was doing, right? I take my car to Jiffy Lube to get the oil changed, and I usually tell people the reason I do that is because it's convenient, which it is, um, but the real reason I do that is because I've kind of sort of forgotten how to change the oil in my car, and I'm kind of scared to start trying now, 
right? Like I don't fix things. That's who I am. And so the fact that I fixed this dishwasher made me want to do a backflip. I, I went to call my wife, but again, realized she was traveling and she couldn't answer. And, and so I needed affirmation. And so I, I needed to talk to someone. So I called my dad, I FaceTimed him and, and I just pointed the phone at the dishwasher. And whenever he answered, I said, be proud of me. Right. And he was understandably confused because he had no idea what was going on. But, um, uh, after I explained the situation and what I had accomplished, he told me good job and that he was in fact proud of me. Right. So, so I tell you this story because I had this like very difficult and yet monumentous day and all of that happened like before lunch and, and I kind of overcame every obstacle and I was feeling good about myself. Right. And again, I tell you this story because, you know, while I had a good day in the manly kind of get stuff done despite all the hurdles department, um, I, you know, I, I, I fixed the dishwasher. It still works. I held my anger in check. I didn't panic. I got stuff done. I tell you this story though, because I want you to understand it, it would be a mistake for me to believe that just because I was able to follow some instructions from a YouTube video one time and fix a dishwasher, it would be a mistake for me to believe that I'm now a handyman. You, you see what I'm saying? Like it, it would be a mistake for me to assume that just because I was able to hold my anger in check on Tuesday that I no longer have a temper today. You, you know what I'm saying? Right? I, I, it seems like something obvious, but I think I have to say that because you know people kind of have that mindset and believe this all the time. Right? Like we saw this playing out over the course of the quarantine when people needed a haircut and yet the barber shops were closed, right? What happened is people started watching YouTube videos on how to get a haircut and give a haircut. And they thought, you know, I could do that. And, and then, you know, they go and they do it. And it looks like they got into a fight with the lawnmower, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it's part of the human condition. This is really what I'm trying to get at. It, it's part of the human condition to drift towards self-reliance, right? To believe that we can and should trust in ourselves to get things done. That's just kind of what sin has done. Sin has bent us in such a way that we believe that we can do anything and we can rely on ourselves for anything. And for the most part, it's kind of harmless, right? Like when it comes to oil changes and, and haircuts and that kind of stuff. Like in those cases, enough practice can make perfect, right? But there are other areas of life where self-reliance is a very, very bad idea. Places and areas such as our faith. In when it comes to faith and following Jesus, we cannot and we should not rely on ourselves. In fact, that is the core of the gospel message. It's telling us that we can't, but that God can. Now, this is what Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, oversimplified, would say. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 say, By grace you have been saved through faith. And he says it explicitly like, like this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not the result of works so that no one may boast, right? So the gospel tells us that, that we cannot work for our salvation. We cannot conjure up enough faith to make God love us or like us or save us. The only thing we can do is trust in Jesus, right? That is not an area where we can rely on ourselves, And yet we live as if we can rely on ourselves all the time. We act as if God will love us more if we obey more, if we avoid him when we aren't obedient, right? And so it's this core belief, this drift of our soul to believe that we can rely on ourselves. Same thing could be said about holiness, right? We have a tendency to drift towards self-reliance when, when it comes to holiness. We believe that we can make ourselves better through obedience and through holy living, right? And so this is what it looks like. Maybe you have kind of a, a, a season where you're acting in accordance with your faith and you're just walking with Jesus, right? Um, and, and, and what happens in those seasons sometimes is if we aren't careful, we start to believe that our efforts in and of themselves and our obedience in and of itself actually makes us holy, right? It, it, and we'll even begin to grade ourselves against other Christians believing that we are better than they are because we sin differently than they do. Well, that's exactly what happened to the scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' day. They were masters of the law. They were absolutely dedicated to keeping it. They were so intense about keeping the law that they tithed off of everything, even 
their spice cabinet. Jesus tells us in Matthew 23, 23, says you tie the mint and dill and cumin, right? So like he was saying, they were intense about the way they kept the law and they believed that their ability, their self-reliance on their ability to keep the law led them to believe that they were holier than other people. And that's just not true, right? That's the idea that Jesus assaults in John 5, 29, when he says to these same Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and yet it is they that bear witness about me, right? Jesus tells them, listen, you think that following the rules in the law is enough to save you, is enough to make you holy? If, if that's what you believe, you've missed the point. The scriptures, if anything, should show you how impossible it is to perfectly obey God. The scriptures should show you how desperately you need help and how much you cannot rely on yourself for salvation. You don't need you, you need me. That's kind of what Jesus was saying there, right? And yet they missed the point. They drifted towards self-reliance. Right? Now here's the deal, okay? I, I think that you you and I, we all know this to be true. We all drift towards self-reliance. And, and God knows this as well. And it wasn't just in Jesus' day, it wasn't just today. Um, this tendency to drift towards self-reliance has been in existence. It's a part of the human condition. And we see God putting in place some safeguards way back in Exodus, which is where we've been. See, God understood this tendency, and, and so he put in the law in Exodus some countermeasures to help us against our own self-reliance. And, and so um, that they would understand that they aren't going to be able to stack up, that they need to rely on God. And so um, that's why at the end of the instructions of the tabernacle, God starts to um, put in these these warnings against self-reliance, and that's kind of what we're going to be looking at today. Now, here's the thing: is when you come to look at this passage and and, and uh, you know the chapters thirty and thirty-one, it looks like some leftover instructions, kind of some odds and ends from the law and the tabernacle construction that Moses, as he was putting this together, he just didn't know where to put it, so he kind of threw it all at the end. It, it feels kind of random, but but I hope to show you here that this is not random at all, that, that here at the end of the law, God inserts an assault on self-reliance. And so we're going to start looking at that in verse 11 of Exodus chapter 30. Um, chapter 30, verse 11. So let's read it. Here it goes. Uh, Exodus 30, verses 11 and 12. It's the Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. So he starts out and he's telling the Israelites, okay, you're going to take a census. And in most situations, a census, um, the only, there's only two reasons really to take a census. It's for taxes and war. Right? You need to know how many men there are so you know many, how many warriors you can put in the army. You need to know how many people you've got so you can make sure they all pay taxes to fund the government. But in Israel's case, it's kind of a strange thing to throw in a census right? because they don't really have a government exactly. They're a theocracy. They just do what God tells them. He's their king. And he's not just their king. He also fights their wars and he funds their every need. Like literally, God fought against the Egyptian army. Um, literally, God provided everything that they would need to survive in the desert by coating the ground with bread and breaking open rocks to give them water. God was their government. God was their army. And so they don't need a census. It feels a little bit out of place. Unless, of course, there's another purpose for the census. And I think we can see several different purposes for this particular census, starting in verse 12. If you look again at verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. See, so the first purpose here of the census was meant to stir up Israel's sense of their own sin. It was God's way of reminding them that they were still sinners. They had the law, yeah, he wants them to follow it. But even with the law, they're still sinners. Just think about what is being said here. They have to pay a ransom. They have to pay God just to avoid the plagues falling on them. Yeah, that's why I think it was. It was a reminder to the Israelites of their sin. Like that the only real difference between the Israelites and the Egyptians, 
who, by the way, did receive the plagues. The only difference between Israel and Egypt is the fact that God chose Israel. Right? They're still sinners, though. And that sin was still an issue. And so God reminds them of that truth by saying, listen, unless you want me to break out against you, you've got to pay this ransom. So I think that's the first thing. It's trying to excite a sense of sin within the people. The other reason behind the census, I think, is, 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 is to point their way towards the fact that they can be forgiven of their sin. A ransom in and of itself tells you that it's meant you pay it in order to have your sin removed. You pay in order to have your guilt be overlooked. It's kind of like paying a fine. You know, you did the crime, but you pay the fine. It covers the cost. It's as if it never happened, right? And so that's kind of what a ransom is. And so the fact that God tells Israel, you can pay a ransom to cover the cost of your sin in order to keep these plagues at bay, it should have been a suggestion to them that it was possible that they be forgiven. Now, granted, the price that they paid for the ransom was so small that it was only symbolic, right? Verse 13 tells us that the price they paid for this ransom was half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, you do all the math, it's around two days labor, right? That's a pretty small price to pay to cover the cost of your sin, suggesting it was really just symbolic. Verses 14 and 15, though, gives us another purpose for this census. It says that everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. And it says this, it says that the rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives. Here's what this says. The price is the same no matter who you are. Right? Rich, poor, all people pay the same price. And it suggests this. It suggests that no matter who you are, your soul is the same price. No matter who you are, all souls are equal and all souls are equally sinful. That's kind of the idea being suggested here. One price for all suggests that all carry the same desperate need for salvation. So the purpose of the census was not to fund the army or the government. The purpose of the census was to show these people that they were all in the same boat. In verse 16, we see that this ransom money was also supposed to be used in the tabernacle, saying you shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel uh, and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting, that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. Um, so this gives us another purpose for the census. This money itself would be used to serve the sanctuary, suggesting that even their service to God was born out of their desperate need for salvation. Add it all up, and I think there's one theme put into play here. It was to reveal to the Israelites that they were not good enough on their own. They, they needed a ransom just to avoid God's displeasure. They needed this ransom to avoid God breaking out against them. They needed this ransom because they weren't enough. And then you got the bronze basin in verses 17 through 21. I'll just read that to you. It says that the Lord said to Moses, You shall also make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar. You shall put water in it with which Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet. And when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generation. All right, so God, talking to the priest, says, listen, um, you need to wash yourself, uh, uh, purify yourself before you can come into the tabernacle and serve me. Now, now, this should feel a little weird for the priest because they just read in the law about how they're supposed to be consecrated. And this consecration was supposed to um, make them clean so that they can come and so that they can serve. And so they had to wonder, okay, if we're consecrated, why do we need to wash our hands and feet? Why do we need to be purified each and every time we re-enter the tabernacle to serve? It, 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 the answer is that the consecration wasn't enough. The, the answer is that their sin continued to collect on their souls because they were still sinners. The consecration made them worthy to serve, but it did not solve their problem of sin. See, I think the point of the bronze basin then was, was to remind them that they live in a sinful, broken world. They live within a sinful, broken flesh, 
and it had been so distorted by sin that it could not be made perfectly clean just through one consecration. And it was supposed to be a reminder that sin was still a problem for them. It was supposed to be a reminder that, that they needed God still just as much as when they were consecrated the first time. Overall, the message that I think is being sent to Israel through this bronze basin is the same message that was sent through the census. They were not okay on their own. They had to keep serving and they had to keep sacrificing just to maintain holiness. It wasn't a one-time deal, but a constant need. So same message being sent twice. Then you've got the anointing oil and the incense that's described in chapter 31, verses 22 through 38. And I'm not going to read all of that to you, so go and read that on your time. But you can see there in that passage, as God goes into detail about how the oil and the incense is supposed to be made, he gives exact measurements. And then in verse 29, he tells the priests to use this oil to consecrate all of the instruments and utensils within the tabernacle. He says, you shall consecrate them that they may be holy. Whatever touches them will become holy. I think it's the same message being sent yet again. It's another way for God to tell the priests that they were not holy on their own, that their touch isn't the thing that made the instruments holy. If anything, the instruments were going to make them holy, right? It says whoever touches them becomes holy, right? Same message being sent once more. You are not okay on your own. You are not holy on your own. You need God to make you holy. You need God to make you be okay. And then we've got Exodus chapter 31, and I want to read just the first six verses to you. Shifts gears a little bit, and it says this. It says that the Lord then said to Moses, See, I've called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cutting stones for setting... Um, and in carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed him with Aholiab, the son of Hissamach of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. Here we see as God tells the Israelites that not only has he commanded the construction of the tabernacle, and, and, not, and given the blueprints for its design, but he is now also providing the people, and he's equipped these people with the necessary skills to make Israel's obedience possible. See, I don't think the message could be any clearer. God was saying here that even when Israel joins in, okay, he's given them all of these things, but even when Israel puts their hand to the task, even then God is still the one that's doing it, not them. So just kind of follow the story here. Here's what's being told to Israel here. We just follow their whole story. They know that God created the entire earth and he gave everything life and breath and meaning. God chose to save Noah from destruction after sinful mankind rebelled against him. God then found Abraham, Abram renamed him Abraham and entered into a covenant with him by promising to make of him a great nation through which all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. God then enabled Abraham and Sarah, his wife, to conceive and made the fulfilling of his promise possible. It was God who used one of Abraham's descendants, Joseph, to secure a spot for his people to survive and thrive through a worldwide famine in Egypt. It was God who allowed Israel to multiply and grow strong even in captivity. It was God who then chose Moses and through him delivered Israel out of Egypt with great miracles and signs. It was God who led Israel through the Red Sea and the desert, leading them by cloud and by fire. It was God who provided quail and manna and water to sustain them in the desert. It was God who drove them and brought them to Mount Sinai. It was God who gave him the, them the commands that bring true life. It was God who gave Israel the blueprints to build the tabernacle so that they could serve him. It was God who provided the plunder from the Egyptians, which would be used to construct the tabernacle itself. And then here we see it was God who filled the people with the skill required to carry out all of his commands. In short, from beginning to end, God did all of it. At no point in time did Israel bring anything at all to the table. From beginning to end, all of it was God. And then it says this in verses 12 and 13. 
It says that the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all you shall keep my Sabbath. For this is a sign between me and you throughout all your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Just think about it. Above all, I want you to keep the Sabbath. It seems a little strange if you think about it. Like out of all of the constructions God has just given to Israel, this was the command that mattered the most. Right? And he was really serious about it. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, shall uh, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever puts any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. So you got to ask the question, why? Why was God so serious about this? And the answer is the same thing. He is assaulting self-reliance. Right? He says in verse 13 that the Sabbath is supposed to be a sign between him and Israel that they may know that he is the Lord and that he's the one that's sanctified. God tells them right there, I want you to take the Sabbath. I want you to take the day off so that you can recognize who it is that's actually doing the work to sanctify. It's not you. Your obedience isn't what's making you holy. It's me that's making you holy in your proximity to me. Verse 16, the people of Israel should keep the Sabbath as a covenant forever. It was supposed to be a sign to the world that God is the one who works on Israel's behalf, that they are in kind of covenant with the one true God. And so while the whole world worked and toiled to take care of themselves and to make progress on their own strength, Israel would take a weekly day off to show that God is the one that did it for them, that they would rest in his provision. Right? It was a way for them to put their trust on display. Right? And, and it goes on. And so here's the deal. For you and for me, I think what this is supposed to show us is that we cannot rely on ourselves. That we, we, we can't. Right? We, we shouldn't. Sabbath was God's invitation to his people to enjoy resting in him. Don't, don't rely on yourself. Rely on me. And this isn't supposed to make us feel bad about ourselves. When I say that self-reliance is... Is a bad thing. I don't want you to punish yourself every time you try to follow Jesus. I've heard that it said that, that we, God is opposed to earning, but not effort. And the idea here is this. God has done it all. So you can stop your striving. You don't have to work to earn his approval. Jesus Christ got it for you. So I, I know that it's kind of a lot of weird stuff in here and it's, it's, it's kind of hard to put it all together but the one message that I want you to get from this is that you cannot trust in yourself to provide salvation only Jesus so I hope that you can see this with fresh new eyes and that you go forward and rest until next time